welcome to episode 60 of Glass Onion. I'm John Lennon, and this is my conversation with Al Sussman. It was actually recorded back in September. I thought I'd try something novel for this episode and not spoil anything to do with the conversation. So uh, I'll make a brief comment before I go to it, after I've dealt with uh, some other bits of business. First of all, thanks a lot for the feedback on the three-parter on John and Elvis with Ghosty. Had lots of nice messages and... The three episodes have sailed quite close to the top of the Glass Onion Hall of Fame, so that's nice. I think maybe I mentioned the Elvis podcast last week, TCB Cast and Jungle Room. And I've actually just recently appeared on the TCB Cast, and it went out a few days ago as I'm recording this. And it was about the Beatles and Elvis and some of their differences, similarities, musical styles, etc., And we were quite careful not to cover the same ground that had been covered on the Glass Onion three-parter. So that was a great conversation. I did bust out the guitar there, as I'm just about to now, because Justin had alerted me to the fact that, in spite of all the danger, the 1958, supposedly original by Paul McCartney, with the guitar riff by George Harrison, is extremely close to an Elvis song called Trying to Get to You. So I demonstrated that. They're in different keys, but the melody is very, very similar almost identical really and there's some similar chord changes as well anyway you'll have to listen to the show to hear that and i'll put that in the show notes on the subject of other podcasts i now have my other two on all the main social media platforms as the phrase goes everywhere you get podcasts film gold i've just put out episode three which was a review of the 1976 film marathon man which has always been one of my favorites but the film got better as i watched it I hadn't watched it for a while. And then I watched the documentaries and it got better. And then we talked about it for an hour and a half to two hours and it got better as well. It's got a lot of depth and very multi-layered. So that's out in the world. And my other podcast, Life and Life Only, has only got the intro episode out at the moment. But I'm going to work quite hard on that podcast for the next couple of weeks. So that will probably be more frequent than the other two. So there's that as well and that will be in the show notes. Now... Last time I did a, I'm not going to call it a guitar lesson, but um, demonstrated a few things in Beatles songs, and a few of you said you wanted more of that. So here's a little bit more. I'm going to demonstrate two fairly simple things in music. One of them is 12-bar blues, or the 12-bar blues pattern. It doesn't have to be a blues song, as you will hear in a second. Now, a lot of people who play guitar, piano, who know basic music theory will already know this, but 12-bar blues is very handy because it means that You can go to a blues open mic, as I used to when I lived in London many years ago, and get up on stage with three, four, five people that you've never met before. And someone says, right, this is a 12-bar blues in A, and everyone knows exactly where to go in terms of which chords to hit. And it's funny, actually, in the whole Beatles canon, there's only really two songs that you could strictly say were 12-bar blues, in terms of original songs, anyway. One of them is 12-bar original, which obviously was never officially released. And I think that really showcased that the Beatles were not the greatest jam band. I'm sure in the early days when they were at the Cavern and in Hamburg, I'm sure the overall effect was fantastic. You know, the early live Beatles that we've never really heard much of. There's a few things have come out, but it's a little bit elusive. But I think that was in terms of the overall effects, like the repartee, the way they performed, um, how relaxed they were on stage, all that kind of thing, how informal. But to our bar original, I don't think is anyone's favourite Beatles outtake. There's a few other near misses. So something like Can't Buy Me Love, the verse. Buy you a diamond ring, my friend, if it makes you feel all right. I'll get you anything, my friend, if it makes you feel all right. If that was a 12-bar blues, it would then go... And it gets very close. She didn't care too much for money. And then she go to the C, but it's G, F, and then it hangs on F. So it's very, very close to being 12 Bar Blues. And then the song Chains, which is a, a cover, which was on the Please Please Me album, that's in B flat. And the only thing that stops it being a 12 Bar Blues is that the E flat is an E flat ninth rather than an E flat natural. Other ones that get close, Money, Little Child, there's so many. Generally, I'm talking about original Beatles songs, so there are... Long Tall Sally is a 12-bar blues, 
there's actually variations within the pattern but uh, in terms of original songs as far as i know and please feel free to correct me the only beatles original that's an absolutely strictly 12 bar blues is the furthest you can get from a blues which is flying from magical mystery tour for those who don't know the 12 bar blues i'm going to use flying to demonstrate it so in the key of c so it would be uh bars of C and on that song they put seventh to make it more interesting and then F two bars of F two bars back to C and then one bar of G one bar of F one bar of C well you've got choice here you can do two bars of C or one bar of C and then back one bar of G and in flying it's one bar of C and then one bar of G and then you can add a seventh the seventh is quite nice because it, it has a, a way of getting you back to the home chord get you back home so to speak so that's a 12 bar blues the other thing was um, what I call the doo-wop sequence now there's actually three variations on this The, the first one I knew really is um, what I call the Stand By Me chord sequence. So we'll do it in G this time. So. When the night has come and the land is dark and the moon is the only light we'll see. So that's G, E minor, and then C and D. So it's one, six minor, four, and five. Other Beatles songs are... There must be some word today From my girlfriend so far away Please, Mr. Postman, look and see If there's a letter, a letter for me These are in different keys, some of these songs. That's in A, for example, but I'm just keeping it in G just to show you how the same sequence can get two very different songs. And a couple of Beatles originals, the end of... Uh, Happiness is a warm God Happiness is a warm God And then I've just seen a face I can't forget the time or place where we just met She's just the girl for me And I want all the world to see we met la, 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 la. There was a passing chord of D in there that wouldn't fit the pattern perfectly, but again, it's just it's the Beatles. That's what they do, you know. They add these other little bits in there. A variation on that is one six minor two minor five. I think we'll switch. Uh, we'll go back to C actually for this. amazing is um again the, the two songs aren't the same key but you've got this boy from 63 same four chords but played different uh, style who knows how long i've loved you you know i love you still and then that goes to E minor. That one doesn't continue on that pattern, but just the beginning of the verses is that pattern. And then, uh, just to show you, if you remember last time I was talking about in Things We Said Today and Norwegian Wood, just that slight chord change. Well, there's one song from Help which really shows John Lennon's uh, genius or laziness or both. I don't know, but uh, you're going to lose that girl. I'll play it in the key. So the chorus is this one, six minor, two minor, five that we've just been doing. So not only can you get girl and this boy and I will, you can get you're gonna lose that girl, you're gonna lose that girl, you're gonna lose that girl. And then for the verse, 
This is the third variation. Instead of the six minor, which in the key of E would be C sharp minor, all he does is just changes the second chord to a three minor, so it's G sharp minor. If you don't take her out tonight, she's gonna change her mind. Change her mind. Cause I will take her out tonight and I will treat her kind. Back to the chorus with just one chord change. You're gonna lose that girl, you're gonna lose that girl, you're gonna lose that girl. So yeah, just a couple of other little tricks there. I can't guarantee I'll be able to do that every time because I don't know if I know that many tricks, but there you go. And just before we get to the show, if you would like to help out the podcast, there's a PayPal link on the homepage, the SoundCloud page. And as I mentioned last time, I've also put together a compilation of the first year of Glass Onion, 20 episodes plus a bonus episode, which is on Bandcamp. That'll all be in the show notes again. If you could help out the show in any way, that would be much appreciated. Apart from that, just sharing links, telling people you know about the podcast, all helps a lot. Okay, so as I said, I'm not going to spoil the talk today with Al Sussman. All I'm going to tell you, in fact... Al is very closely associated with the Beatle Fan magazine, as he mentioned. But actually, I knew him originally from the podcast Things We Said Today, which he was a guest host on for a long time. And I think he still does guest appearances on other podcasts. So he's around the the Beatles author podcast scene and very well-respected figure. So we just have a very freewheeling discussion that was loosely based on the idea of John Lennon as an enigma, which is obviously something we've explored a lot on the show but uh, it goes in different directions some John Lennon related some more generally Beatle related but anyway I'm going to let you get on with listening and I'll be back on the other side with a few words enjoy hello everybody this is Glass Onion on John Lennon I'm absolutely delighted to have with me Al Sussman a phrase popped into my head Al that you are the godfather of Beatles writing how do you feel about that <laughs> uh, hardly <laughs> <laughs> Maybe the grandfather or something uh, like that, but not uh, the godfather. Uh, uh, godfather uh, sounds better. Plenty of others that are uh, more of uh, the, the the godfathers of uh, Beatles, right? Mark Lewis and most yeah. particularly. Just to tell you what a crazy world of technology we live in, I actually contacted you a year ago. Uh, sorry it's taken so long, by the way, but uh, I contacted you when I was in India. I went to India last year for the first time ever. This is so weird. I was in a place called Varanasi, northeast India. And in fact, George Harrison went there just before he died. It's on the Ganges. And it's a very, very mm-hmm. holy place. And I was actually, this is so bizarre. I was in a traffic jam. And traffic jams in India are like traffic jams nowhere else in the world. Because, you know, in India, the, the cow is sacred. Right. And essentially, cows, you, you find cows lying in the road and no one's actually allowed to I think I got this right. If any Indians are listening and they want to put me straight, go ahead. But you're not supposed to, like, shoo them out. So all these, in the rush hour, you get all these cars dodging cows. I remember it so clearly. I was in the middle of the rush hour and I thought, oh, yeah, I'll be meaning to message uh, Al. So I was actually messaging you from a traffic jam in Varanasi. How weird is that? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, it's a crazy world. Anyway, listen, could, certainly... you, could you just introduce yourself to our audience, please? Well, I'm the uh, the executive editor of Beetle Fan Magazine. Beetle Fan has been uh, in existence for just over 41 years, and I've been writing for 40 of those years. Wow! And also, I uh, about seven years ago, I uh, wrote a book called mm-hmm. Changing Times: 101 Days to Shape the Generation which was published the same week that Mark Lewison's Tune In uh, mm. was published. Gee, wonder which book <laughs> got more attention. <laughs> that was a bad week, you see. You should have waited. Though. <laughs> exactly. Wow. And is that, was that a Beatles book or is that about the era? Or? No, well, uh, only partially. Basically, it's about the uh, 101 days beginning November 22nd, 1963. Oh, so you know right, how it right. begins and ending March 1st, 1964, which along with the assassination of President Kennedy and the breakthrough of the Beatles in America was also a period when there was a lot of change, which either was ongoing or which was kind of uh, ruminating in the Mm. background. Doing the research was really fascinating because Mm. so much of it came to pass as time wore on. Mm. So many of those changes. 
And, uh, and I've also been involved with the Fest for Beatles fans, where it used to be Beatle Fest for virtually its entire existence. Uh, what year was the first one of those? 1974. September of 1974. Did the yes. interest in the Beatles die down in the 70s, or is that a myth? Not in the 70s. Actually, in okay. the 70s, the aura of the group mm. really was almost in competition with uh, with the, the solo careers. In fact, right. they, there's a piece on that which appears, or the first part of which appears in the current issue of Beatle Fan, what I call the 50-year afterlife of, mm. of the Beatles. But in the 80s, there was a period there in the early to mid 80s after mm. John Lennon's murder, mm. when it did seem that the group was kind of fading away into history. But then came the release of the CDs in 1988, or mm. 87, 87 and 88. 87, yeah. 87, yeah. Right. Yeah. And then the, the settling of the, the EMI Apple lawsuit, which paved mm. the way for the BBC releases and the, the whole Beatles anthology project. But there was, though, yeah, there was a period mm. there where interest in the Beatles themselves as a group was at a kind of at a low ebb. Yeah, I think since about the early 90s, I, I think it's just been a constant. The last oh, 30, yeah. 30 years has just been... You know, it's been as if they'd never gone away, really, hasn't it? Exactly. Because I mean, I, I when people ask about whether they're still popular, I always point to the fact yeah. that that simple little 27-track Greatest Hits album, one, mm. is the single biggest selling album of the first decade of the 21st century yeah. and one of the biggest selling albums of the 2010s as well. I mean, I haven't bought CDs for a while, to be honest. I tend to go with digital now, but mm-hmm. I don't really forever when I used to go to record shops, finding the Beatles in what they call the bargain bin. No. Their albums have always been full priced. And I kind of mean that in a good way, you know. They, yeah, it's true. They've always seemed relevant. Um, the only time when there was a little bit of chicanery in that, uh, in that vein was over Let It Be. And that um, was an Alan Klein thing where right. copies of, uh, I think, legitimate copies of Let It Be did end mm. up in, you know, in what they call the cutout bins. Yeah, yeah, we call them the bargain bins in, in England. Yes, yeah, yeah that's right. exactly. Yeah, on that subject, actually, uh, there will be quite a few tangents today, and uh, I did tell you that before, and you said you didn't know. Oh, so. the tangents are great. I love tangents. I've been listening to the Nagra Reels. Uh-oh. Uh, by the way, this may not be going out for a while because I've got a huge backlog of episodes, but we're recording this on the 1st of September, just to let the listeners mm-hmm. know. About a month and a half ago, I discovered that someone had put them all on YouTube. Obviously, there's mm-hmm. not vid- video, it's all audio. So I've been working my way through it, and I- I've listened to all the ones that are online, and we're up to about the 25th of January. But I tell okay. you, it's absolutely fascinating. You know, sometimes it's tough to listen to, and I, I was talking to someone about this, the most boring bits are when they're playing 12 bar blues because they're not yes. really a jam band. They never really were a jam right. band. No. And I think the worst couple of days, George Harrison left on the 10th. Right. And then they came back on the 13th, which was a Monday, and they had two more days at Twickenham without him. And they were the absolute worst because John and Paul are just sitting around trading one liners, which aren't mm-hmm. really very funny. And just noodling, you know what noodling means on the guitar, where you're just yes. playing stuff that's not really going anywhere. And just hanging mm-hmm. around doing nothing and wasting time. And Michael Lindsay Hogg's there kind of trying to play along with it. But I think just to, to work it around to John Lennon, what comes out of it is that he seems a bit detached on some days, but he seemed to brighten up as the month goes on, you know, and mm-hmm. as they're sort of edging their way towards uh, showtime, even though, you know, they still don't know exactly what they're doing until the day before they go on the roof. Were you aware that Alan Williams was there for a short time? No, I never knew that. I heard it on the, on the tape, and I thought, oh, is that Alan Williams? And then you hear them say, oh, hello, Al, or something. I guess, even though Alan Williams is generally regarded with affection, I think everyone mm-hmm. agrees he's a bit of a hustler, and I couldn't quite get what the conversation oh, yeah. was, but I think it was something to do with uh, some... It wasn't the Hamburg tapes, but it was something going on with some business deal or something. And they're going, yeah, all right, Alan. Yeah. <laughs> Whatever you say. Right? Yeah. But what's amazing. I mean, that, that's only, you know, what was it? Eight and a half years from him driving them to Hamburg on that first yeah. trip, you know? 
it's true. And uh, the other interesting thing about the Let It Be sessions is that it's almost like the first Beatles anthology because they sit around talking about the old days and it's when they start playing stuff from the Decca auditions which was January, so that's exactly seven years earlier. They just suddenly yeah. start playing Glad All Over and mm-hmm. Three Cool Cats and everything. That's a fascinating journey listening through. And, and when, Billy, when Billy appears, uh, Billy Preston's not actually, he's on a lot of it in the last few days of the month, but he appears yeah. on something like the 22nd, the 23rd, and I think they actually just literally grabbed him. George grabbed him in reception and said, oh, you know, will you come and play? I mean, technically, I think he's a streets ahead of the others, to be perfectly honest, you know? Oh, yeah, because, yeah. I mean, he had that by that time and had so many years under his belt yeah. of, you know, session work and uh, and touring with, uh, mm. you know, giants like Ray Charles and Little Richard, mm. et cetera, et cetera. Oh, yeah, he was a complete master. Yeah, he was. Quite similar to Hendrix, actually, because... Yes. I don't know if people know, but Hendrix spent years playing rhythm guitar on the on the Chitlin circuit, wasn't it? Yeah. What does that actually mean, the Chitlin? Do you know um, where that comes from? I, it, it's uh, you know from the the, the South, and uh, oh. I'm a Northerner, so. Oh, right, right. <laughs> but uh, but I know Chitlins were a Southern dish, and ah. I think in a lot of cases it was kind of like <laughs> that was what they were. A lot of the artists were served. You know, if, oh, if anything, you know, yeah, especially like, you know, the blues guys, you know, the old blues guys who, you know, were not playing in, in exactly uh, palatial theaters or anything like that. Yeah. Well, that's interesting because, of course, scouse is the food that the sailors used to eat. Kind, yeah. Kind of a beef stew. I think it was something mm-hmm. like that. The mm. one time that I was in Liverpool and I ate, I ate lunch at the Grapes. And I think I had, it's been 30, 30 years or so, but I think I had Scouse there. All right. How was it? There I, I seem to recall it being pretty good. <laughs> good. It's tough to remember after 30 years. Yeah. What year did you go to, to Liverpool? 89. So that was really 89. before the city had really started to embrace their Beatle past. You know, mm. like the Cavern Walks had, I think, had just opened. Mm. And the Beatles, the Beatles shop, you know, across the way. But that was about it. If you ever go back to Liverpool, the thing you've got to do is the Mendips and Fourth Lynn Road tour. Yeah. Oh, I tell you, that is magic. That is pure magic. Mm-hmm. It's interesting. I, I told you I went to India last year. And um, right. I, I flew into Delhi. And Delhi is about is an overnight trip from Rishikesh. And part, part of me is thinking, you know, I'm only a few hours from Rishikesh. I need to go there. And I didn't go there in the end because I was in India in the monsoon season. And there's a certain point where, you know, everything is dependent on, you know, when the next uh, rainstorm's coming and it just wasn't feasible. But I read some reviews online about people who'd done it and they said it was good. But the problem is that there's no evidence. So there's nothing you can actually look at physically that tells you that the Beatles are there. Yeah. Then it's just kind of, a vague memory that a band you like were there 50 years ago. Whereas if you go to Fourth Lynn Road and Mendips, they've done such a good job of making it look authentic. And obviously there's still fixtures in the house. You know, so you can see the sink where Jim McCartney used to, you know, wash the, his smalls in a, in a, in a bucket because right. he didn't have a washing machine. And, yeah. you know, during the tour they, in Mendips, they encourage people to, to stand in the porch because the porch is where Mimi banished John and Paul. You know, so oh, you can see yeah. a nowhere boy. You know, and it is amazing to me to, to go to John Lennon's bedroom and to think this is where John, Paul, you know, Stuart Sutcliffe was surely in that room as well at some point, Cynthia, George, and that they were in that room listening to, I don't know, Memphis, Tennessee, and trying to write down yeah. the words, you know. But if you ever go, I mean, you, you have to do that talk. Yeah. Well, I know mm. uh, Jackie Spencer. Who does who does a lot of the t- the tours there? Mm-hmm. And uh, one of these years, I'm going to get back. Obviously, right now is not mm. the <laughs> not the best time. But, yeah. Uh, yeah. You know, maybe so, next year. That was a funny moment, actually. When I I've I've done the tour about full time four times, and um, I think the first time I went there, there was a fella who was the custodian who actually looked a lot like Paul McCartney. And there's a video of him on YouTube outside talking to fans, and he's drinking a a can of strong lager. But anyway, I, I thought it, I thought it was great. Like he had a great sense of humor. 
and we were in the garden of Paul's house. And I said for a joke, oh, is this grass original? And he said, uh, no, no, Paul smoked all the original grass. So. Uh. <laughs> <laughs> that was good. But yeah, and of course, in, in Paul's house, what they've done is they have put Mike McCartney's framed photos on the wall next to the point right. in the house where the photo was taken. You must have seen the famous photo of John and Paul practicing. I saw her standing there. Oh, sure. Yeah. So the, you can actually see in that photo a little bit of the fireplace. And uh-huh. then the photo is on the wall just above that fireplace. Anyway, I'm going to stop rabbiting and I'm going to ask you some questions. <laughs> okay. I always ask guests their John Lennon slash Beatles origin story. And you've actually got some memories of when the Beatles were actually around. So I'm going to give you the floor. I'm going to be quiet and let you speak. So go well, I guess the origin story basically starts January 7th, 1964, mm-hmm. which was a Tuesday night. And uh, that was when I first heard, I want to hold your hand. Uh, I was ostensibly doing my homework, <laughs> but I would have the, uh, the radio on. And that was the, the night when the big top 40 station in New York, WABC, would yeah. have their new survey. So while I'm supposed to be doing my homework, I'm actually listening to them counting down the, the, the top seven songs. Mm-hmm. And I'm trying to figure out what the number one song could be because the, the previous number one, which was Louie Louie by the Kingsmen, oh, yeah. had dropped. And it wasn't that, and it wasn't there. I've said it again by Bobby Fenton, and it wasn't Surfing Bird by the Trash Men. And I, what could be the number one song? And they come on with the, the number one song, the, the jingle and all. Mm. And it's this record that I had never heard of. Yeah. I want to hold your hand. But my first reaction to it was negative because it was so new and completely different from anything Mm. that was being produced in America at that point. And to this 14 year old's ears, Mm. it just seemed alien. Of course, they get to school the next day and all these girls are going crazy over this group that they probably hadn't heard of a week before. So that made my reaction even more negative. It actually took until the Ed Sullivan shows and specifically Mm. the one from Miami Beach to win me over. It wasn't until you know, years and years later that I realized why. It was because of the fact that, first of all, it wasn't being done in a TV studio. It was being done in the ballroom yeah. of the Deauville Hotel in Miami Beach and on a small stage. So they're pretty close together. And they're only about, I don't know, four or five months removed from playing ballrooms in England, because Brian, you know, didn't want to, even though they had had three massive number one singles, he didn't want to go back on his commitments. And so they were still playing fairly small venues, uh, even in the fall of 63, even when She Loves You was becoming a phenomenon. So I think it was that and the sound mix as such, which really accentuated Paul's bass and Ringo's drumming the best rhythm section in rock and roll. And then probably the one that really did it for me was this boy. The three of them, you know, gathered around the one microphone and especially that incredible middle eight that John does that I thought was very, very cool. Yeah. It's almost like uh, having an extra Everly brother there. (laughs) Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. Very much so. And then I started reading up on them and I could tell right away that John Lennon was a very interesting, you know, right from the get go, you could tell that he was Mm. very interesting. And during that first trip, now, of course, he was, he was really minding his P's and Q's for the most part. Uh, I don't know whether it was, you know, him saying, well, you know, this is my group, so I really need to be, you know, I really need to behave myself or Brian had Mm. said, (laughs) take it easy on the sarcasm and and the other stuff. But aside from the, the one problem at the, the British Embassy in Washington, John was, you know, was definitely on his best behavior. But you could sell it. it was not your typical teen idol rock star of the day that had nothing to say and wasn't interesting at all. And uh, you could tell that there was a lot more going on with John than just, you know, just being a rock and roll musician. 
Oh, that's interesting. I mean, we're calling today's show John Lennon the Enigma. We'll definitely get onto that in a sec. But um, yeah, it's interesting. You said you had a negative reaction to "Want to Hold Your Hand" because history is full of that of, with music and cinema. That things which are too new. The one that always comes to mind is Psycho. You know, the original Psycho. Yeah. I don't know when was the last time you saw it was, but the first half of the film you're following Janet Lee and she's stolen some money from her, her boss or her boss's client. Mm-hmm. And audiences then would have thought, oh, we're, we're watching the story of uh, Marion Crane, you know, Janet Lee's character. And then yeah. suddenly she's killed in the shower and she's gone from the story and the story completely switches. And Right. I think my point is that that happens a lot. You know, if you are ahead of your time, you know, you often sometimes have to wait for the public to catch up, you know. I think so. Yeah. It's funny because I want to hold your hand now sounds like just this quaint, you know, 60s song, but it's uh, uh, when you, when you hear that and she loves you as well. I mean, those are just huge sounding records Mm. and Mm. there was nothing of that musical caliber, but also anything that sounded like that, at least in America at that point. And there's something about the production. I mean, there's a few songs like um, Everybody's Trying to Be My Baby from Beatles for Sale, where George's vocal mm-hmm. is, is very low in the mix. And there's a, few, there's a few dodgy bits. But in general, those singles, I think, were brilliantly produced because they were produced to have impact. And uh, yeah, they were just so perfectly designed. You know, the first three singles from you know what you might call her their boy band period <laughs> are fairly, fairly simple sonically. But She Loves You comes roaring out of the speakers. And so did I Want to Hold Your Hand. And Mm. especially in America with the little uh, five-inch transistor radios with Phil Spector and also uh, Motown as well. I mean, they really designed their singles to be heard on those little AM speakers. And certainly I Want to Hold Your Hand and She Loves You and Can't Buy Me Love as well, really took advantage of that kind of that format. Excellent. All right. I've got a couple of uh, kind of generic questions here. but uh, Sure. What would be your favorite John Lennon albums? We can kind of include Beatles if you want. Uh, what John Lennon albums would you gravitate to? Actually, it's funny because uh, uh, Bill King, the publisher of Beatle Fan, just mm. polled a bunch of the comp- contributors for a piece mm. that he's doing on our favorite solo Beatles albums, and we could only we could only uh, pick one for each Beatle, which I said for especially for Paul, I said that's impossible. But for John, actually, I think my favorite is Mind Games. Because you've got really the, the really the end of his kind of political radical chic period with uh, Bring On the Lucy, but also it's got some beautiful, beautiful, and of course Mind Games was a, a very big hit single. But also there's some wonderful songs like One Day at a Time and You Are Here, yeah. Intuition, great stuff. So that's, it's always an album that as, you know, just as a listen, I've really enjoyed. I think what marks the album out, and I'm not saying this is a good or a bad thing. I mm-hmm. think the songs are all quite similar tempo, aren't they, on the album? It's a, quite a conventional, which isn't a bad thing necessarily. It's, yeah, except for Bring On The Lucy, which is more of a, more of an upbeat, uh, you know, probably closer to what he was doing on uh, sometime in New York City. Yeah, they are either kind of like medium paced or, you know, in the case of You Are Here, ballads. Mine is uh, Plastic Ono Band. And I'd say in terms of Beatles albums, I think perhaps Rubber Soul, like thinking from a John Lennon angle, Rubber Soul or the White Album in terms of his contribution. What would you say about (laughs) that? Oh, yeah. John's work on, on Rubber Soul you know both the you know the american and british versions is just wonderful stuff i really don't know the american albums very well i mean i know the titles and i oh, and yeah. I, I know that dave dexter put lots of echo on them i know that much but <laughs> i don't know too much beyond that well the, the, what happened was they you know they kind of sliced and diced them mm. quite a bit especially Revolver, where, you know, there are more George Harrison songs on the American Revolver than Lennon songs, Mm -hmm. even though that's another, in its full form, in the British form, it's, uh, you know, very much a a Lennon album. And I think the White Album, perhaps in the same way that the Primal Therapy 
inspired the Plastic Ono Bad album. I think this period of withdrawal that they had in India, because my theory is that John Lennon, I mean, by his own admission, basically had a drug sustaining him throughout his adult life, whether it was yeah. alcohol or amphetamines or weed, and then LSD, mm -hmm. and then, you know, cocaine and heroin. He kind of did the whole yeah. gamut. You know, I think they may have snuck some weed into Rishi Kesh, but uh, essentially, so. yeah, essentially, John Lennon is having this massive withdrawal period where all, you know, he's meditating. And I mean, I, I do meditate myself. It's not about thinking. It's about trying to clear out the thoughts. And then you get mm. visions, but not visions in a mystical way. It just means that once you've cleared out all the, the sort of intrusive thoughts, then you kind of get the truth. And I think perhaps, you know, I'm playing kind of psychologist here, but mm -hmm. I think all the childhood stuff was finally allowed to express itself in India. And then I think it happened again yeah. in the primal therapy. And I think I'm So Tired is always one of my absolute favorite of his songs, just because of the way he delivers it. And, you know, the way it goes from I'm So Tired to the way he screams, you know, the give you everything I've got for a little peace of mind. I mean, yeah. So on that subject, have you got like a top three John Lennon songs, perhaps from, from his interview? Oh, boy. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Oh it's only because I heard you on the other podcast talking about this. So I thought you might have like a, a list in your pocket that you could. Well, uh, it's funny because when, if I'm forced to say, to give a top five Beatles songs, right. I think three of them are John Lennon songs. All You right. Need Is Love. Let's see. The one that I always, after I give like the top five, and then I think, wait a minute, I didn't include If, if I Fell which is one of my all-time favorite songs. Yeah. Like, I do you remember when you were with Ethan, the one that I couldn't agree with you was Good Night. I think you had that in your top five. Didn't yes. You? What did you think of the yeah. version on the, the 50th anniversary with the heart? Oh, my God. When um, I think the first time I heard – well, no, I, I was alone the first time I heard it, but there was a White Album symposium at mm -hmm. uh, Monmouth University in November – of uh, 2018 and um, Mark Lapidus the fellow who does the Fest for Beatles fans he and I did what we called an unboxing of the the deluxe package of the White Album and we played a few few tracks and I swear when we played that take of Good Night I almost went down the chute emotionally yeah. it's it's so gorgeous yeah I think that box just pushed White Album up to being my favorite Beatles album. It's so difficult, but mm -hmm. I kind of choose it in a practical sense because if I went to a desert island, that's the one that has the most on it, you know, in terms of the most Absolutely. songs, but also sort of density. As far as I'm concerned, John has one of the five best rock and roll voices right. in the entire history of the music. Right. What would you be know? the other ones? Well, certainly Elvis, yeah, Van Morrison, probably Jim Morrison as well, mm -hmm. and a fifth one I'd have to think about. There's something about John Lennon. I know it's become a cliche, but I still say it's true. You know, when I listen to Plastic Ono Band, I like there's like a shudder going through my body. You know, <laughs> yeah, when you hear him scream, and and I mean Jim Morrison had a different upbringing. I mean he. You know, but you, you can grow up rich and still be, you know, fairly screwed up, right? You don't have to be poor or yeah. to have a tough child. And I think Jim Morrison, there's a few. Backdoor Man is one of the ones that, I mean, Kurt Cobain, to give a sort of more recent example. Yeah. Those screams really do seem real. You know, they're not put on. And I think it would have been great for Oh Darling and also Why Don't We Do It In The Road if they'd done a duet. Because yeah. I, I think it might have even brought them closer together, you know, because we know that they were growing apart so i think mm -hmm. I, I can imagine a great you know duetting through the whole song you know every yeah. single line perhaps that, that would have been cool absolutely i mean Maybe. look at uh look at you know two of us and and one after 909 yeah i love two of us because i've on the nagra reels i've just been listening to about two hours of them uh, working that song out yeah and, uh, it's oh, it's fantastic you know mm -hmm. i know that song's supposed to be about linda but you know I'm sure, you know, Paul was channeling uh, John. Well, I think I so, yeah. Absolutely. Yeah. Okay. 
Right, perhaps we should get on to the topic. I guess the question I'd really like to ask you, because I, I was born in 75, so I've got no first-hand knowledge of John Lennon. I mean, I was five when he died, and I don't really remember it on the news. I sort of came to Beatles consciousness sometime in the mid to late 80s, so I've been, about, mm-hmm. been a big fan for about 30 years. But um, I think you were saying earlier that even in 64, you kind of marked him out as different because it's, yeah. it's so difficult because he died and because he died in the manner he died it's so difficult yes. to know how much of his status is to do with the fact that he died so do you have memories of when he was alive like how did you view him in terms of the other Beatles perhaps well after John's death for the first Beatle Fest that was held this is in March of 81 Mark Lapidus decided to put together a booklet of fan memories and reflections. And uh, by that time, I had been writing for Beatle Fan for a couple of years already. So I did a piece for that booklet. And in it, I, I, I said that I felt that, that John Lennon is the single most interesting figure in the entire history of rock and roll. You know, more so than Pete Townsend or Bob Dylan or mm. numerous others, because he was never boring. He was always interesting to some degree, whether it was good <laughs> being interesting in a good way or in a bad way. Yeah. And you, you, you couldn't really pin him down, you know, image wise. You know, he didn't have a pat image mm. because if you were able to kind of pin him down a little bit, two weeks later, he would do something yeah. to totally shatter that, that image. Mm. And like I said, you could see that even on that, that first trip, that he was just so much more interesting than mm. Troy Donahue, who was, uh, you, know, your, you know, your basic. TV movie star of, of the early mid sixties, you know, very crafted. And, mm. you know, if he, if he said anything, it was, you know, it was done through the filter of a press agent or, or whatever, even, even Elvis had gotten to that point. And John just kind of like, you know, said pretty much whatever, you know, was on his mind. In fact, I remember and, and this is again, this is in the spring of 64. Right. And of course, there were all of these Beatles magazines coming out at that point. And I, there was one of them that had an article in which they talked about religion. So this is two years before the, the, the Maureen Cleave interview, mm. but it had comments that really from all four of them. And at that point, they were all agnostics. Oh, you know, right. They didn't really believe, even if they believed in God and they were <laughs> not completely sure of that, they were at least anti-organized religion. Yeah. And for that time, that was fairly heavy stuff for a, for a pop star to mm. be getting into, you know, let alone the whole thing two years later, which was, of course, completely true and completely valid for that moment in time. So little things like that showed how, you know, how different he was and really the whole group. But certainly he was, you know, almost worth the price of admission because Mm. he was just so much more interesting. And of course, as the the decade wore on, that became even more so. And, And in the decade between the end of the Beatles and his murder, He made so many different moves in a in a personal sense or in a career sense and or in a musical sense. So he just was totally unpredictable. Yeah, I mean one of the things that I've kind of been doing on the show, because this show's been going it's getting on for two years now. And what's interesting is that the more and more I study it, the more I find that he was doing just like little acts of rebellion that kind of slipped through the net. And I mean, yep. e- even just to the point of lo- of uh, undoing the top button on his tie. Yeah. <laughs> but there's other ones. I mean, obviously the the clap your hands and stamp your feet thing, which yeah. I guess is kind of frowned upon nowadays. But it's quite amazing to watch the Washington Coliseum and mm-hmm. to see him do that and think that. I mean, maybe you know better than me, but I don't think there was any reaction to that at the time. I don't know. None. Absolutely no. none. It Isn't wasn't it until years later. Yeah. And then, um, I mean, there's other things. I mean, when they got the um, Variety Club Awards and he said to Harold Wilson, thanks for the Purple Hearts. Yes. I mean, that 
I'm not sure if he meant it as a double meaning, but if he did, I mean, that's genius because Purple Hearts is obviously an amphetamine, but it's also a medal that's given out to soldiers. Yeah. But I think even John Lennon perhaps wouldn't have been too aware of Vietnam in 64. Perhaps he was, perhaps he wasn't. In I don't 64, know. I'm not, sure. not, not really so much because mm. the war had really not been overly militarized uh, at that point. The escalation of the war had didn't really take place in, until 65 because yeah. Johnson campaigning in 64, one of his uh, you know primary lines was that we're not going to send American boys to fight an Asian yeah. war. <laughs> and then, you know, a year later, he pretty much quadruples the yeah. troop strength. Yeah, because I actually studied Vietnam quite a lot. And I mean, invariably, when you really study some world events you find there's all kinds of other things going on that have never really come out in the light so to speak 65 is officially you know when the u.s had ground troops and things but um yeah Mm -hmm. i mean that's another story i I won't go into that right now but um, (laughs) yeah i'd need about an hour to explain that but (laughs) exactly yeah (laughs) but then there's other things like in 65 uh when they're on their way to the bahamas or they're in the bahamas and the reporter says what did you do on the flight and john says we got stoned yeah (laughs) and the reporter immediately says well i know you're only joking and john says uh no i'm not joking yeah (laughs) (laughs) although in fairness uh stoned actually used to mean drunk famous uh, yeah that's true let's you know let's go get stoned you know the ray charles uh song is uh, not about drugs it's uh, about getting drunk do you remember the movie high society there's a song, sure. well, did you ever, with Bing Crosby and yeah. Sinatra, and they sing, she was stunned. I'm sure they're talking about drink. but uh, Oh, no question. But then, you know, in 66, I mean, perhaps you could help me with this. It's never really been verified, but in one of the books it said that John Lennon had said that he was in favor. If he was American, he'd go to Canada to avoid the draft. Do you remember him ever mm-hmm. saying that? Because I... I'm not sure if that's ever I been believe, verified. I believe he he said this, and you know who would know more about this? Absolutely, would well two people. One would be Chuck Gunderson, oh, yeah, uh, the yeah. author of uh, Some Fun Tonight, I and read the this other I will. and the other is uh, Jude Kessler, who mm. you've had here. If I remember correctly, it was at the press conference in Toronto that he he discussed mm. it because it was you know they had already told Brian that they did want to speak out against the war. But they sort of compromised and said, okay, we'll do it outside of the States, except that when they got to New York, they spoke out against it again about going to uh, Canada to avoid Mm. the draft. Wow, interesting. So I think we both agree that John Lennon had very interesting contradictions. Yes. (laughs) And um, in the last year, I've read biographies of three of the most fascinating characters, which is Marlon Brando, Muhammad Ali, and Elvis Presley. Oh, yeah. uh, who all happen to be American, of course. And I, I kind of have a theory that I think American lives, because America is so much bigger and so much more diverse. Tell me if you agree with this. I'd say America is also a country of extremes. Where very much so. I'd say if you were to sum up Britain, I'd say it's a very moderate country. I don't think we have huge extremes. Yeah. But uh, I was just going to say that Brando, Ali, and Presley, uh, you know, I read massive biographies of them, and they were always interesting and full of contradictions and you know to give you an example muhammad ali basically whenever there were about three people in the room he turned into you know the muhammad ali that we know you know the Mm -hmm. i am the greatest and everything right but then when there was only one one other person in the room he could go very very quiet and brando was capable of wild behavior but brando was also capable of sitting reading a book for hours on end and john lennon was a big reader you know so they, they kind of go between loud and outlandish but they're also capable of being very quiet you know and i'll give you i'll give you a a non-human example of that as well Mm. and that's secretariat the racehorse because Uh. uh, after he had been retired during the day you know the tourists would come by the uh, the corral where Mm. uh, where he was and you know he'd just kind of be hanging out there having his lunch you know having having a bucket of oats or something (laughs) just hanging out and then he would see the people come and it was like a button was pushed and like, okay, showtime. And yeah. he would start galloping around the corral mm. and it would like to make the whole circuit and then come over to the tourists 
pose for pictures and all that sort of thing. And then they would leave and he'd go back to his bucket of oats. Yeah. (laughs) That same kind of thing. And, you know, and Ali is really the one that I really kind of paired with, with secretariat in that, Mm -hmm. in that respect. Cause like you say, when he would be training, if there was nobody in the uh, in the gym, he'd be going through his you know his training regimen. Mm. But as soon as folks came in, like you say, he would he would become the the Louisville lip. Yeah, know? absolutely. Yeah, but uh, it's just terribly sad as well. You know, I mean, it is. You know, Muhammad Ali got Parkinson's. Marlon Brando really had a terrible life in many ways. You know, he struggled. Yeah, he was seeing a psychiatrist, and he was in his early twenties. John Lennon, obviously, you know, I'm not sure how happy John Lennon was in 1980. I, mm. I feel the jury's out with that. And uh, again, yeah. another show, because I've really been covering the gamut. I've done 50 odd episodes, nearly 60 actually, because the show is only one person rather than Beatles. And because it's obviously a limited, unfortunately, he only had, you know, 20 years of adult life. Yeah. We've really done to death almost you know this this discussion about where he was i mean where do you where do you think he was in 1980 would you go more with the ray coleman narrative or the goldman narrative or somewhere in the middle i think somewhere in the middle actually (laughs) it certainly wasn't as idyllic you know as ray painted it and certainly it's not nothing like the portrait that goldman painted you know we don't really know what the dynamics were of the marriage at that point. You know, I think the only thing we we know for sure is that his musical juices were kind of resuscitated Mm. by what was going on musically at that point, you Mm. know, (laughs) including coming up, but also by a lot of the, uh, you know, the new wave and somewhat the punk material that was coming out at that Mm. point. People like Bruce Springsteen also, who he really made a couple of references to in those those last interviews where he talked about being really interested in to see what Bruce's career would would be like once he stopped singing about cars and girls. <laughs> and, yeah. and I think he would have been very pleased to see how Bruce's career turned out. Yeah, funny thing with Bruce Springsteen, just as a little tangent here. I said I was born in 75, so I got into the Beatles late 80s. So for a while in the mid 80s, I was into current bands, which at that time would have been people like Duran Duran and U2 and uh, the Smiths. I always loved the Smiths. But Springsteen was one. And of course, the song that I knew him from was Born in the USA and Dancing in the Dark. I didn't even know about, you know, uh, The River and uh, Born to Run. But I always took Born in the USA as, as some terrible kind of patriotic song. But of course, it's all ironic, isn't it? Yeah. You know, it it's kind of means the opposite. It's uh, almost like yeah, a protest it was, song. It, it was so ironic that in 84, uh, that both Reagan and Mondale basically kind of adopted that song yeah, because yeah. of the, you know, the refrain and then, then didn't really pay attention to the verses yeah, that exactly. were, and especially in, in Reagan's case, uh, they were, you know, not at all complimentary about the government. Absolutely. I didn't pay attention either, but my excuse is I was only nine. So, uh... oh, of course. Yeah. <laughs> well, I'd say about John Lennon, 1980. I mean, I, I've kind of done it to death on my show. My listeners are probably bored of hearing me talk about it, but we know that obviously he didn't re- compose all of Double Fancy in one go. No. But, but that, you know, that doesn't really bother me because clearly he had some sort of inspiration in Bermuda. So we don't really need to argue the, the ins and outs of that. And mm-hmm. I don't think anybody expects a rock star to, always tell you know the hundred percent the truth when he's giving interviews because he's giving an interview you know he's right it's entertainment you know but um i don't think he was looking particularly healthy i think he looked pretty skinny and that's very true and that's you know, i think that's kind of fueled the uh the speculation you know that he was back on heroin again we don't you know we don't know for sure there right. doesn't seem to be anything coming out of the of the sessions you know, anybody that participated in them from Jack Douglas to Earl Slick and beyond. Anybody who has said, well, you know, at various points during the session, he would go to the bathroom or something, and you know, which would kind of be a clue. But there was apparently none of that, at least nothing that has really come out. Yeah. But he did. He was very, you know, especially those pictures that uh, Annie Leibovitz took 
Hmm. on the morning of December 8th. Oh, yeah, yeah, he's very skinny and you can tell the beginnings of, of his hairline beginning to creep north. Hmm. A little bit of gray. Yeah, hair. yeah, exactly. I actually had um, Caitlin. I talked to Caitlin Hare, who was Marnie Hare's daughter, mm-hmm. who was Sean Lennon's playmate in the Dakota. And she came in on uh, Yeah, that was amazing. And um, one of the things she said was that John Lennon had enormous energy a kind of a manic energy mm-hmm. yeah i get the impression a lot of that may have been sort of nervous energy let's say because i think i think fred seaman's kind of much maligned but i had someone on the show who was a friend of fred's who's verified a lot well some of fred's book let's call it and he said mm-hmm. you know john lennon was a quite a nervous kind of edgy guy you know he was sort of yeah he lived on the edge let's let's say you know yeah you know, and he was in these lovely apartments of Dakota, but it, it was sort of always surrounded by people. You know, there were kids running around, there was nannies. And mm-hmm. <laughs> there's a couple of funny stories about, you know, he, he was dying to go to his room and get stoned in peace, and he couldn't. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> because, uh, you know, there were always people bugging him. And uh, Anyway, yeah, as you said, the, yeah. tru- the truth is in the middle. It's just, it just depends w- which side of the middle it, it, it veers towards, I think. I think so. Yeah. 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 I mean, we're, we're probably never going to know, especially oh. now, you know I mean? Cause Yoko now is, is quite elderly and probably doesn't have all that many years left and she'll probably take a lot of secrets with her. Yeah. One of the terrible ironies, of course, we did a show in 1972 and all about John's politics. And uh, I was reading in a book recently, the author was saying that the horrible irony is that if Nixon had kicked him out of the U.S., he probably would still be alive. Yeah, I know. That's true, because he probably would have had to go back to, to England mm. and, uh, you know, presumably continued on with his music career or whatever, but mm. there wouldn't have been a situation like that. Of course, someone did break into George Harrison's house. and That's true. You know, I mean, I, yeah. I didn't realize at the time. I, I do remember it. It was right before the millennium, wasn't it? it was December 99. Yeah. Perhaps I would, didn't read the news reports properly or, or something, but I didn't realize, you know, the, you know, this guy stabbed him a few times and, and George was yeah. really moments from death, really. Yeah. If it hadn't, um, frankly, if it hadn't been for Olivia. That's right. Fending the guy off with yeah. furniture, he probably would have finished, uh, finished George off. I think it was a lamp or something. She was whacking the guy on I the think, head with. Yeah, I think so, yeah. What do you think was the effect of John Lennon going to America? Do you think it was good for him? Or I know it's a very, very general question, but any insights you might have? I think it was good because he, you know, they had always talked back in the 60s during the tours about the fact that as dreadful as the, the touring was in, in those days, the mm. highlights of the touring were the American trips. Mm. You know, because of the fact that America was so big and also was, you know, so much more modern than England was Mm -hmm. at that time, because England was still coming out of the all the austerity of uh, of the post-war years. Yeah, rationing. We had rationing. Yeah. Until the mid fifties. Yeah. 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 Mm. Exactly. And and especially since he talked about New York in particular being very much like Liverpool. Yeah. Maybe definitely. just like a bigger a bigger version of Liverpool. Mm. So I think it was I think it was a you know a, a, it was a good thing and mm. uh you know as one that lived you know I lived in you know outside of New York for mm. really my whole life until about 5 years ago it felt nice even though I never I I never went to the Dakota it just felt nice that he was there. Did you have any contact with any of the Beatles? The only one I've met is Ringo, okay. and that was uh, at a, a CD signing. I think he was for the uh, the Storytellers live album. Uh, okay. But no, I've never met Paul, and and never even had an opportunity mm. to meet either either John or George. Oh, I can just hear the banging now. <laughs> yeah, they're a little closer to uh, to my walls. Well, I was planning to wind down, actually, because I've got to do another class quite soon. Oh, uh, yes. <laughs> now, one interesting thing, um, we were chatting uh, by Messenger the last couple of weeks, haven't we? And um, 
I said that uh, one of the questions I always ask is, uh, what would John Lennon have done? And you said that you didn't want to answer that, but you had a reason. So give well, us, it was so, wasn't reason? so much that I didn't want to answer that, but it was, mm. it was just like I was saying before. He was just so unpredictable, and he made so many different turns that it would be very difficult to be able to, you know, ascertain, you know, where he would have gone musically, personally, mm. whatever, even in just the years immediately following 1980, other than the fact that we, we do know that they were planning on touring in 81, mm. yeah. but especially considering that it's been so long now, you know, I mean, it's 40 mm. years. Incredible. And, isn't it? Yeah. and when, when people speculate about, you know, what John Lennon would be like now as a, you know, nearly 80 year old, you know, I just find it's just impossible. But then yeah. again, you know, something like that scene in Yesterday. Mm. Robert uh, Carlyle. Yeah. Mm. yeah, exactly. You know, seeing it, I think, and a lot of people that I know, especially of the contemporaries of mine who, mm. you know, do have firsthand memories of John, it was very emotional mm. because we miss him and have always missed him because of the fact that he was because he was so interesting yeah. and so unpredictable since so that particular scene, whether or not you want to, you know, speculate on whether, you know, John would have looked like that at this point in his life, <laughs> who knows, but yeah. still it was, uh, it was an emotional shot. Yeah. There's another one actually, um, Ian Hart, who was John Lennon in mm -hmm. Beat. They made a, a short film. It's only about 35 minutes called Snodgrass. It's, I think it's John Lennon in his mid fifties. Ian Hart always does a good job with John Lennon. He seemed to have really tapped into something. So I'd, I'd recommend that. I'll put it as a yeah. link, actually. You know, obviously, because I've asked a lot of guests about this, the, the two things that I'm fairly certain about, I think he would have embraced grunge. You know, the grunge Nirvana, mm -hmm. Pearl Jam. Yeah. And I can kind of equate it to Neil Young did an album with Pearl Jam called Mirrorball in the mid-90s, which is a good album. And I could see John Lennon as a kind of quite cool old rocker, you know? Yeah. Kind of an older guy who kind of gets away with it and can still look quite cool with his long gray hair, you know? Yeah. I think the other one, he would have, I think he would have embraced rap. I don't think he would have become a rapper, but I think things like hip hop, you know, I don't know if you've heard of Public Enemy and those kind of bands. Sure. Because I think that, yeah. would, have, that would have appealed to the activist side and, and the advantage with rap is that you can speak the words directly, like it doesn't have to rhyme or, you know, obviously a lot of rap does rhyme, but mm -hmm. I think that would have appealed to him. You know, if you compare him with McCartney, Bowie, Dylan, they all had a sort of dodgy 80s. I think he might yeah. have had a dodgy 80s and re-emerged in the 90s. That's what I feel. <laughs> That's very possible because certainly, you know, he was, as I said, he was kind of nudged back into, into performing because of the influence of of a lot of the you know sort of punk and new wave that was mm -hmm. you know that was coming out there at the end of the 70s so i would think that probably grunge you know would have had some appeal for him and possibly yeah early hip hop because i remember he was and i remember you know people later with talking kind of pejoratively about it, the fact that in the Tom Snyder interview that he did in 75, mm. he was mentioning the fact that he liked disco. And the, the disco of 1975 was quite different from the stuff that was out in the wake of Saturday Night Fever and, yeah. and all Studio 54 and all that stuff. It was a lot more original, a lot more organic. So probably hip-hop may have had the same... Uh, like you say, Public Enemy, Grandmaster Flash yeah. uh, might have had that same kind of uh, organic appeal to him. He was in a strange position because was it Esquire that did the article that unfortunately his, his killer read that article and that was one of the things that in his mind put the idea of John Lennon as a mm. hypo hypocrite that he, you know, he'd settled into a comfortable, quite a conservative small C lifestyle. Mm. And I think, you know, that probably would have continued, but I think the Public Enemy or NWA or those bands, I think, you know, he wouldn't have had to be involved in it, but I think he would have appreciated the activists sticking it to the man, you know. Mm -hmm. And how do you think, uh, do you think John Lennon would have embraced the Beatles anthology? Do you think he would have been fully invested in it? 
That's a very good question. Whether, <laughs> yeah. uh, you know, because obviously, and people have brought this up, the fact that they did those those sessions and, you know, used the, the, the tapes that Yoko had given them. But, you know, who knows whether John actually would have been receptive. And, you know, he might have because he had kind of mellowed, you can tell by the Playboy interview. Hmm. that he had mellowed, you know, quite a bit, you know, about the Beatles and about the, hmm. the songs that he had written during that period. And, you know, that mellowing process might have continued. And so who knows? It's, uh, it's possible. But then, you know, like I said, he was also known to have his... <laughs> his issues. His issues, exactly. And then yeah. to just be, uh, you know, a contrarian a lot of the times. Yeah, I feel like, I mean, I guess it's common knowledge now that one of the main reasons George got involved was because he'd been screwed by yes, it, Dennis, Dennis O'Brien, wasn't it? Dennis O'Brien, yeah, exactly, because so we needed, needed the money. I was trying to picture the dynamic. You know that uh, bit where they're sitting in George's back garden playing the ukuleles? Yeah. I, I tried to imagine if John had been there, and I, I feel like John and George would have been quietly kind of ribbing Paul, you know, sort of mm-hmm. making fun of him a little bit. because I. I think the anthology was not made for his benefit, but the way it was presented was very poor. Yeah. You know, it was very oh, yeah. kind of nostalgic, nothing too dark, you know, kind of like that. And I feel like George is always, again, I'm totally guilty of overanalyzing, but if you kind of look at it, George is always a tiny bit stepping away from it. You know, it's like, yeah, if Paul yeah, wants definitely. a limelight, then okay, give him the limelight. Yeah, uh, it's so, true. It's true. I, Even in that, that scene where they're, you know, um, they're, they're going to do Pink Blue Moon of Kentucky and George kind of like slyly says, do the short version. Oh, yeah, yeah. <laughs> I like uh, thinking of linking, you know, that, da, 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 that intro. I, I, yeah. I thought that was quite good, but they only had one verse. though. But, <laughs> but just to circle back to the beginning of our conversation, I was, I was saying yeah. that on these, on these Nagra reels, they actually do thinking of linking on the Nagra reels as well. And it's funny. It's almost like the first Beatles anthology. It's so strange. Yeah. That's how, you know, how they ended up pulling out uh, the one after 909. Oh, yeah. And uh, I even recall, you know, like a couple of the, the comments that Paul was making. And he happened to mention a song called Too Bad About Sorrows. Yeah, that's right. And I can remember seeing references to that song in, you know, it's like fan magazines or Beatles Mm. Monthly or something in the mid 60s. But of course, nothing ever came of the song. You know, it's, Mm. you know, it was never recorded by anybody. Yeah, there's the other one is just fun, isn't it? They, They make reference to that at Twickenham as well. Yeah. Yes. Wow. So interesting. It's 50 years later, there's still, we still don't know too much, you know, there's still more to know. That's true. Yeah. We have to keep Mark Lewis and healthy. Yeah. Yeah. What's the latest on when the volume two is coming out? Have we got any inside Uh, gossip? (laughs) Yeah. He he says that, I mean, basically it's like he he, he compares it to the seventies when, you know, when the Beatles were asked on a, you know, on a daily basis, when are you guys getting mm. back together? He's asked every day, mm. you know, when is volume two coming out? Mm. And he's still at work on it. You know, basically it'll be ready when it's ready. <laughs> exactly. I'd say 2022, if I had to guess. I would say, I, don't know I would anything. say, I would say yeah. so. But he, you know, in fact, he actually made a suggestion to us at Beatle Fan because I guess so many of the sources that he either had interviewed or never got to interview have died in recent mm. years mm. he suggested that we might want to make a uh, a list what he called a beatles necrology oh my god yeah and in fact <laughs> the list is so large that we had to space it over two issues because <sighs> so many people that were part of the story are gone yeah well that was almost like a running joke i mean when he did the first volume that um Exactly what you said, yeah. He, he managed to mm-hmm. talk to people just before they died. and uh, Yeah. He even kind of joked uh, that uh, he was putting some sort of curse on them. Cause yeah. <laughs> as soon as they spoke to him, they died. But uh, no, seriously, uh, I think he's intimated that it might even end up as a four-parter. Ah, right. It could, yeah, that's true. Because I mean, especially, because I think the, the second book, yeah, I think it's supposed to cover the period up through, I think, 66. Right. And so then, Oof. you know, there's so much 
in the period after that from 67 through through 69 and you know whether whether he's going to go beyond there i don't mm. know isn't it amazing though for him because he's he says that he he more or less puts in like an eight hour day you know yeah he, he almost does a nine to five every day which is mm-hmm. just must be so astonishing and of course he he said quite rightly he did the hornsey road tour because he need to bring some money in you know he's, he's probably yeah. been extremely patient but <laughs> right but uh it must be just incredible i think what we'll probably find you know there's a lot of discussion about oh, when do the beatles stop being john's band and becomes paul's band for me yeah. tune in volume one john lennon was really the main man you know everything came from him mm-hmm. you know and the others were not bit players but they were you know paul and george seemed to be pretty much in awe of him and Paul has said, you know, he was their fairground hero. And uh, there's, a, there's quite a touching bit, actually, in about 60 or 61, where he says something like, oh, for all John's wild behavior, you know, because he went pretty wild after Stuart oh, yeah. died. They were never going to leave him. You know, they, they realize, you know, they're with somebody special. Mm-hmm. And the guy is a one-off. So I think perhaps we can conclude from this that John Lennon was an enigma, but that, you know, a lot of his reputation now does come from when he was alive it's not just because he died prematurely i guess we can agree that's that. very true very true yeah. he, even as late as 64 on that first tour you could tell it was his band i can recall in fact even making you know the occasional reference to that saying that if there's a leader it's john and i think he even made the, that reference himself yeah I, my feeling about it just from everything I've read and everything. I, th- I think from 66, there was still a fair amount of equality going on. But I yes. think I think 67, if you look at pictures of John Lennon, he looks so terrible. Like He's obviously mm-hmm. clearly been doing vast amounts of LSD. And I think John Lennon had destroyed his ego to the extent where Paul was, was in charge. And I think from these Nagra reels, I mean, I don't quite buy the thing that Paul was always very pushy. I think there's one day from memory where they're doing get back and he's micromanaging because he's actually sort of saying to Ringo, I'll oh, do this bit on the symbol, do this bit on mm. the, go back to the floor, Tom. And then he's saying to John, why don't you do this harmony? Get back, get back. You know, he's sort of singing harmonies. And I think that's the day that George walks out actually. But I think mm. it would be a little bit unfair from what I've heard to say that he was doing that all the time. But by 69, in a way, I think John's weakened himself through drug abuse that's but it's, uh, really exactly. a mix, it's really a matter of energy a lot of the time. Yeah, I think so. I'm so tired. That's it. Yeah, what a great song. So I said, that's well up there with Happiness is a Warm Guard as well, one I didn't mention earlier. Yeah. Yeah. All right. Is there anything you'd like to say or anything you'd like to, as a kind of wrapping up here? No, this has been, uh, this has been a lot of fun. You know, it's nice to be able to devote a good chunk of time to remembering him as he really was rather than the you know the saintly yeah. idol up on mount beetle that a lot of people yeah. i think have uh, created for him yeah i mean actually this is almost certainly going out in probably november actually because mm-hmm. of this backlog of episodes so i think we've had as listeners are hearing this we've had the the birthday but i'm going to say from the perspective of september where we're recording this i'm I think the sanitized version is going to be the dominant one, but you know, Probably, unfortunately. It, doesn't, it doesn't matter. You know I mean? All you have to do really is put the songs on and then everything else goes out the window, you know? That's just, true. Just it's the, it's the music or, that counts. Yeah. Just listen to 10 or 20 of his songs and then the rest doesn't really matter. That's for sure. Yeah. We'll just stay on the line for a sec, but uh, sure. thanks, thanks a lot for doing this and um, yeah, good luck and You're- keep enjoying your retirement. Ah, thanks. Yeah, and uh, thank you for in- inviting me. This was great. You're very welcome. All right. All the best. Bye. You too. So there you have it. That was episode 60. Thanks again to Al for joining me. And as you just heard, we were discussing Mark Lewis and good luck to Mark as well on uh, part two of the trilogy. And if he's listening, feel free to get in touch. I've never contacted him to come on the show because I just figured that he gets probably... 10 or 20 people a day asking him to do stuff but uh, if you are interested mark you can contact me glass onion pod at yahoo.com and same for everyone else if you want to offer feedback ratings and reviews share the shows consider an entirely voluntary donation and most of all just keep listening the next show is going to be with ken womack 
Another one that was recorded a while ago, I think it was back in October, either just after or just before John Lennon's posthumous 80th birthday. Ken, of course, brought out his book, John Lennon 1980, The Last Days in the Life, last year. I know he's appeared on lots of other shows, but I don't remember it because I haven't started editing it yet, but uh, I hope I found a few new things to ask him. Who knows? You'll see. And inevitably, John Lennon's state of happiness in 1980 crept into the conversation. Just very sneaky. Anyway, that's to look forward to. So, um, a very concise, no frills episode this one. I hope you enjoyed it, and I'll be back very soon with Ken Welbeck. So, all the best. Thanks for listening, and goodbye.